All right, uh, now you probably can hear me. <laughs> Hopefully, okay, good. Sorry about that. I forgot my phone, so I had to do the two-factor authentication. Anyway, um, so does anyone have any questions about anything? All right, I'll take that as a no. So uh, we're just gonna pick up where we did uh, left off last time in chapter 10, talking about photosynthesis. And so um, we talked about the light reaction um, and that that fuels the dark reaction uh, or the Calvin cycle uh, by providing it with ATP and NADPH. And remember NADPH is just like NADH, it's an electron carrier. And then you guys know ATP, that's our energy source. And it's we add phosphates to things to change their shape or decrease their delta G so we can make spontaneous reactions and things like that. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so um I have slides that go through this step by step, but I just want to kind of redraw this just to remind everyone <clears throat> of what's going on. So remember that photosystem two was discovered uh, second, and that's why it's named two, even though it comes first in the reaction. And then photosystem one was discovered afterwards, and it, even though it comes second, it's still named photosystem one. I didn't name it. Um, if it were up to me, I would have changed the name, but scientists tend to do this. <clears throat> and you'll see this as the class goes on. Okay, so um, right now we're just talking about the light reaction. So on the test, uh, I'll ask you, uh, where does the light reaction occur? And the answer is in the thylakoid, right? So it's in the thylakoid membrane. And I'll show you that a video of that in a second. So what's going on? This is the this, these are the chlorophylls. And remember, we have chlorophyll uh, A, which is in the reaction center. It's the only one that participates in the reaction. All the other ones are accessory pigments like chlorophyll B and the carotenoids, which you guys did for your photosynthesis lab. And their job is to focus the light energy on A. So it's kind of like a satellite dish or that death ray I showed you. It's focusing all the light energy on A, kind of like a magnifying glass to, to get enough energy on uh, chlorophyll A and specifically Specifically, all that light energy is going on this magnesium. So every bit of, of, of the focus of that, you know, magnifying glass of light is to, it's not to burn this thing, but it's almost the same. If you were going to burn an ant or set a fire. So all that light energy is focusing on magnesium. And remember in chapter two, when we put a bunch of energy into an atom, it makes the electrons go further away from the nucleus. Um, and so that's what's going on here. We got all this light energy from chlorophyll Bs and all the accessory pigments, focusing on chlorophyll A, that magnesium in chlorophyll A. And this is what we're talking about. This is the antenna complex right here. So it's the same. This could easily be photosystem one or photosystem two. They look almost the same. And remember, they they occur in the membrane of the thylakoids, which are in these grain on these stacks of discs. So, light energy uh, focuses on that. The chlorophyll A molecule, magnesium, gets excited. It jumps to a higher energy state. We keep putting energy on it, and it floats off like the moon would if the Earth no longer had gravitational pull on it. All right, so that's what's going on here, and these electrons leak. Right, so the electrons are gone and they have to be replaced with new electrons, right? It's, uh, it would be like if you, the, the uh, power plants that made electricity uh, didn't replace the electricity that you used, then you'd run out of electricity. 
So we have to replace the electrons. And to do that, we use water. So, well, plants use water. They split water into, remember, uh, hydrogen is protons, which are H pluses. There's two water, so there's two H pluses and two electrons, and that accounts for the H2. And then the oxygen, chemists draw this as one half O2, but that's really one oxygen, which is this oxygen right here. So that when water split, it becomes two protons, two electrons, and one half of an oxygen or a single O. And those two electrons go back into the chlorophyll A reaction center to replace the ones that went away up to this electron transport chain. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Okay. So, so we're flowing electrons. This is the same thing that happened in, in uh, respiration and cellular respiration. The, it pumps protons, so I'm not going to I'm not going to recap this whole thing. We're pumping, you know, we're pumping these protons across the membrane. Uh, it goes down through ATP synthase, which is located here, same one that was in respiration. Turns that motor right, squashes the ADP and the phosphate to make ATP. So, and and. In actuality, you could take the ATP synthase out of a chloroplast and put it in a mitochondria, and it wouldn't know the difference. So that's that's how these ATP are being made. And then the electron, so this other photosystem, photosystem one, is is downstream of this, and it's the same things going on. So all this antenna complex, these uh, lighter color, the Chlorophyll B is lighter colored, so that's why the artist drew it this way. Chlorophyll A is darker. And so all this energy is getting focused on chlorophyll A. The electrons jump to a higher energy level, and they go down another electron transport chain. And then they go on to the electron carriers. So these, this thing is carrying two electrons now. And it's going to go to the dark reaction. Um, and then these ATP are also going to go to the dark reaction like we showed here, all right? And that's the whole purpose of it. So a couple of things you need to know for this, for the test, the main difference between photosystem two and photosystem one is the reaction center chlorophyll A. That reaction center chlorophyll A is called P680 in photosystem two because it absorbs light best at 680 nanometers, remember? We said visible light is between 700 nanometers, well, 750 and 400 nanometers. And it differs between how old you are and, and your genetics and if you're male or female. So anyway, on the test, I might ask you, why is that called P680? And you're gonna answer me that because it's best at absorbing lights of wavelength of 680 nanometers, okay? Photosystem one, it's downstream. It's the main difference of that is that it has a chlorophyll A, it's called P700. And the reason it's called P700, can you guess? It's best at 700 nanometers. Exactly. It's best at seven, absorbing light at 700 nanometers. So you all are gonna get this right on the test, right? I promise you it's gonna be on there. Yes. Okay. So that's the purpose of the light reaction. We've made ATP. So what went in? So same deal, what went in? Well, here we have light as energy because we need that. Remember, this is an endogonic reaction. So we have to put energy in. Uh, the, we also need water to replace the electrons that are split. Um, and that's pretty much it. So we just need water and light energy and then what comes out of that is ATP, which is here. And then we also get NADPH, which is an electron carrier. It actually, this carries two electrons because we're taking two electrons off of water. So if we remove water, we remove electrons from water, is it oxidized or reduced?
Remember, if you lose electrons, you're oxidized, right? Leo the line goes grr. This gains electrons, so it's reduced. So make sure you guys know this because I will ask you on the test. Um, these oxidation reduction reactions are super important to life, right? They make ATP. And without it, life wouldn't exist and biology class wouldn't exist. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the difference between photosystem one and two. Remember, photosystem two comes before one. Sounds like my house. Okay, so. Uh, Sorry. It's fine. It's no, no big deal. Uh, okay, so uh, when we do this, right? I'm not, I'm not going to go over the whole light system, but we'll just say photosystem two, right? It's sending its electrons down an electron transport chain to photosystem one, who's sending its electrons down an electron transport chain to NADPH. And so every time it does this, it makes an ATP. Remember we said we, we need two protons for each ATP. And there's only one, one mem integral membrane protein here. So these two electrons pump two protons and they make one ATP. So every time these electrons go from here to here, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm drawing like a, a, I just got new hands, but uh, my desk is moved and it's a little hard to draw on this pad now, but. Um, anyway, so that's the flow of electrons. So we're making one ATP and we're making one NADPH, remember, because this thing carries two electrons. So that makes sense. Two electrons go from here, two electrons go from here, the two electrons end up here, two electrons are used to make ATP. So we make one ATP and one NADPH per reaction. And we can just say it's per water molecule because we need a water to replace the electrons from that. Okay, so this is what we call non-cyclic electron flow. The electrons are going from point A to point B, right? Photosystem two all the way through to do NADPH. Um, remember this occurs in the thylakoid membrane. So this is the light reaction. The electrons continuously flow from water to NADP plus to make NADH, NAD, sorry, NADPH. So electron, in, in non-cyclic, the electrons are constantly going in this direction, right? It's just like electrons going to the vacuum cleaner motor. We produce ATP, right? Through a photophosphorylation, which is uh, the, that same sort of chemiosmosis that we talked about uh, that Peter Mitchell discovered uh, with ATP synthase with electrons transferring. And then we make this, and then remember oxygen is, is given off as a byproduct by from splitting this water originally to free the electrons. All right. And if you sit down with this and kind of draw it out, it'll help you remember how, what, what everything works. You know, it's, uh, uh, I don't know, kind of learning how to like assemble a, a, a Lego truck or something. You know, once you do it a few times, you'll you'll know how to do it. So you just got to sit down and like, so okay, this is step one, this is step two, this is step three, this is step four. Um, all right. So so this is just a uh, in class I do transparencies, but you can go back and look at these slides. It's basically the same thing. So remember, photosystem two takes in the light, right? It, takes in the light from the, from the antenna complex, which we talked about in a previous slide. And I can find that slide real quick. So this is, so slide 13 is when we talked about the antenna complex. Come on, you. Okay, so the excited chlorophyll A electron uh, goes to a higher energy level, right? When we put energy, light energy on uh, that magnesium, it jumps. It's actually two electrons. 
to a higher energy level. So they, they're leaving the chlorophyll A. And this one from photosystem two, if you guys remember, this is called P680. And why is it called P680? That's how it um, absorbs the light. Right, that's the, that's, that's the wavelength is best at absorbing light. So that electron is moved away from the nucleus, right? This is, this is slide uh, 14. Electron moves away from the nucleus, goes down an electron transport chain. That chlorophyll is now missing an electron. So we're talking about P680. It's actually missing two electrons. And so remember, if it loses an electron, it's oxidized. So that's, you should know that. Then uh, an enzyme extracts electrons from water and gives them to P680 to replace the missing electrons. So those electrons are water split, the electrons go in there. Um, and then we talked about how they're split into hydrogens and oxygens. And then these are split into protons and electrons because a hydrogen really is just one proton and an electron. You go back and look at the periodic table and you can see that. So oh, remember one oxygen doesn't, isn't happy on its own because it has to have a full outer shell. This only has six electrons in its outer shell. So it's missing two. So it, will, it combines with another oxygen so that they, they make a double bond. And we talked about this in chapter two and that uh, makes O2. Um, so that is released as a gas, but that occurs after two of these cycles are completed. So that excited electron goes from the electron acceptor of photosystem two to photosystem one. Remember, and the photosystem one, the chlorophyll A is uh, called P700. Why is it called P700? 700 is what it absorbs like. Right, 700 nanometers is its best absorbance, correct. And, the, and again, this is slide 14. So this is, come on you. Slide 14. And that it's, the, it's very similar to, uh, respiration. So electrons go down there. And this is basically what I just talked about. And they end up on, they end up on NADPH. So you guys can go through that. Um, all right, so this is the, the time where I should probably show you a video of how this works. So I'm just gonna go to YouTube. And there's tons of videos on, on uh, uh, photo systems. Or the, that's also called the light reaction. Right? Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically. Okay, um, let me stop sharing this and I will share this YouTube uh, window with you. The process of photosynthesis produces ATP from ADP and PI by using the energy from light to excite electrons. So PI is inorganic phosphate. That means it's free phosphate. It's, it's phosphate. 
it just hasn't combined with anything that's carbon. So that means it's inorganic because if it was bound to a carbon molecule like a ATP or ADP, then it would be uh, inorganic or organic phosphate, sorry. So. But have passed along an electron transport chain. Coupled with the transfer of electrons is the pumping of hydrogen ions and the splitting of water molecules. The following complexes are found in the photosynthesis electron transport chain. Photosystem two, cytochrome B6F. You don't need to know that. You don't need to know cytochrome B6F. You do need to know the one for the uh, respiration. So talked about coenzyme Q10 and cytochrome C, but for this, you just need to know photosystem two, photosystem one. Photosystem one, ferredoxin NADP reductase. You don't need to know that. And the complex that makes ATP. You should know this, it's ATP synthase. It's the same thing that we talked about in um, respiration. ATP synthase. In addition to the complexes, three mobile carriers are also involved. You don't need to know the mobile carriers either. We just talked about them as electron transport chains. Oh, plastoquinone QB, plastocyanin, and ferredoxin. Other key components include photons, chlorophyll molecules, protons, water, molecular oxygen, NADP and the electrons to form NADPH, and ADP and PI, which combine to form ATP. Photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplasts of plants and algae. The process is also found in single cell organisms, such as cyanobacteria, that do not have chloroplasts. Like its mitochondrial counterpart, the chloroplast electron transport chain consists of several protein complexes and mobile electron carriers. First, a photon of light hits a chlorophyll molecule surrounding the photosystem II complex. This creates resonance energy that is transferred through neighboring chlorophyll molecules. When this energy reaches the reaction center embedded in photosystem two, an electron is released. So remember, this is, this is P680. It's a very specific chlorophyll A uh, that is releasing the electrons from magnesium. The reaction center chlorophyll contains electrons that can be transferred when excited. One photon is needed to excite each of the electrons in this chlorophyll. Once excited, two electrons are transferred to plastoquinone QB, the first mobile carrier. So we just called that the electron transport chain or the electron acceptor. You don't need to know the name of it. In addition to the two electrons, QB also picks up two protons from the stroma. The two electrons lost from photosystem two are replaced by the splitting of water molecules. Water splitting also releases hydrogen ions into the lumen. This contributes to a hydrogen ion gradient similar to the one created by mitochondrial electron transport. After two water molecules have been split, one molecule of molecular oxygen is created. Plastoquinone QB then transfers the two electrons to the cytochrome B6F complex. The two protons it picked up are released into the lumen. These transfers are coupled with the pumping of two more hydrogen ions into the lumen space by cytochrome B6F. The electrons are next transferred to plastocyanin, another mobile carrier. Next, the electrons are transferred from plastocyanin to the photosystem one complex. It is here that photons again energize each electron and propel their transfer to ferredoxin. Ferredoxin then transfers the electrons to the ferredoxin NADP reductase, also known as FNR. After two electrons are transferred to FNR, NADPH is made by adding the two electrons and a hydrogen ion to NADP. The gradient created by the electron transport chain 
is utilized by ATP synthase to create ATP from ADP and PI. This is similar to the way ATP is synthesized in the mitochondria. ATP, NADPH, and molecular oxygen are the final vital products of photosynthesis. So that's the light reaction. Uh, this, this crash course is more of a down to earth uh, explanation of it. So, you know, if you guys are having a hard time with this, I highly recommend watching this crash course video on photosynthesis. And, and actually, I like all the crash course videos. They have a green screen, they have a production team, you know, they're, they're making, you know, tens of thousands of dollars off of their YouTube videos. So you might as well take advantage of it. Um, and and uh, it, it, it's a, it does a good job of explaining it into a down to earth way. But that's kind of what's going on. So, you know, the electrons are going from photosystem two through the electron transport chain. Um, photosystem one is giving up its electrons and putting those on NADP uh, to make NADPH. Uh, and it's an electron carrier. And then the protons are getting pumped and those are making ATP in a one-to-one -one ratio like we talked about. So I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. Um, and so this is just basically what I just showed you and um, I can draw on this just to sort of recap it. But. So the light energy is, is hitting uh, photosystem one and photosystem two simultaneously. The electrons are going to jump to a higher energy level. Then they go uh, through here. The protons are, are pumped, actually pumped in to the lumen, whereas in the mitochondria, they were pumped out of the lumen. And then this goes on to replace the electrons that were lost from photosystem one which ends up on NADP to make NADPH. So, and then, and then, and this is the, the protons go out rather than in, and that makes ATP. And this is ATP synthase. So we have a buildup of protons on the inside of the thylakoid Remember the thylakoid's a disc like this. So the protons are built up here. And we get a negative charge here, which was different than the mitochondria because in the mitochondria, we had the two membranes and we had a built up, built up of positive charges in between the membranes and negative ones on the inside. But other than that, it's exactly the same. Okay. So here's the problem is that in I'm just jumping ahead to this slide. So I just, because I'm going to talk about what's going on here. So in the end, in the dark reaction and the Calvin cycle to make a half of a glucose. So uh, if you go back to chapter nine and you look at glycolysis, when we split glucose in half, we made this glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So this is a half of glucose. When plants are doing the Calvin cycle, they're producing half of a glucose. Um, and so if they want to make a whole glucose, they have to make two circles of the dark reaction. And that together makes one glucose. And then you guys know if we add two glucoses together, we get maltose. And this is from chapter five. And then if we add a bunch more glucoses together, we get amylose which on your nutritional carb packs, it says carbs, same deal. So that's what plants are doing. They're making half glucoses, putting them together, making long chains of glucose into carbs that you get, that's what you use for energy. To make a half of a glucose, this glyceraldehyde three phosphate, we need three carbon dioxides. That mean, right? Because the glucose is C6. So that would make sense. We need to make a triose. So it's going to be, we need three carbons because there's only one carbon per CO2. We need nine ATP molecules to, as the energy to drive this reaction. Remember, because this is an, this is an energy 
uh, we're making energy rich molecules from energy poor molecules. We're, we're taking carbon dioxide and, and water and we're making oxygen and glucose. And so that, that runs uphill, that delta G is, is a positive. Then that's a, that's an uh, endo endergonic reaction, which means we need energy. This is where energy comes from. You know, it came directly from light, but it made ATPs, and that's really how living systems use energy is ATP. So we need nine energy molecules to make this, and then we need six NADPHs. Remember, these have a lot of energy. Like remember, the electron carriers they made. Uh, 17 times more ATP and respiration than, than uh, the Krebs cycle. So these are also energy. Uh, this is energy. Uh, all this energy is what uh, allows us to, to produce, or allows plants to produce sugars from, and oxygen from carbon dioxide and water. Now, if, if you remember, I told you when we went from photosystem to through the electron transport chain to photosystem one, and then on to NAD to make the NADPH, and we and we made one ATP. So we made one ATP and one NADPH. And this is a one-to-one -one ratio, and that's a problem because this is not a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you made a one-to-one -one ratio of these molecules, ATP and NADPH, then you would have a tremendous buildup of ATPs that you that you couldn't utilize because we would have we wouldn't have enough ATPs to fulfill the requirements. Does that make sense? We're right right now we're short three ATPs because we would only make six if we did a one to one ratio like this. So we need more ATP, and to do that. Plants can do this amazing thing where they send the electrons back through this first electron transport chain to make another ATP. So they can make extra ATPs before sending the electrons on to NADPH or uh, photosystem one. Um, so let me back up. So that is called cyclic electron flow. There's a switch, right? It's kind of like a gate. So think about it this way. We have photosystem two, we have photosystem one. This is gonna give up the two electrons and go through here and on to NADPH. And we're gonna make ATP here. So what happens is, is that Let's, so let's say we have one water. So that water is going to flow electrons through, and we're going to make one ATP, and we're going to make one NADPH. So that, that would be a non-cyclic electron flow. It would go on to the electron carrier. Does that make sense? So the next time this gate switches and sends it back this way, so the next time we go, we make one ATP and then we go back and we make two ATPs for one NADH. So now we have three ATPs and two NADHs. Does that make sense? So the first time we had one ATP and one NADPH, this time we have one ATP, goes back, makes another. So we have two ATP and one more NADH. So we have three ATP and two NADPHs. You guys see that? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so that's two waters. We've done two waters. Now we're going to do a third water. So the third water, the gate switches again, and it's a straight up flow. So we make one more ATP. So now we're four ATPs. And three NADPHs. Does that make sense? All right. Now we're going to do four waters. We're going to switch the gate. So now it's going to go through here and make one ATP, come back, make two ATP. So we're going to have 
I'm just gonna mark this off. We have six ATP and, and we make one more NADPH because it's gonna go here, one ATP, two ATP, one NADPH. So now we have four NADPHs, right? And this is four waters. And so we're gonna do five and the gate's gonna switch. So this time it's gonna go a straight flow. So instead of six, we'll have seven ATP and instead of four, we'll have five NADPHs. And now we've used five waters. And then on the last one, the gate's gonna switch again. So we go in here, one ATP, two ATPs, one NADPH. So now we're gonna have nine ATP and six NADPHs after we've flowed six waters. So see how we can get this nine uh, ATPs by switching that gate and going cyclic, which is when it goes comes back versus straight through, which is non-cyclic. And now our ratios are right to make one half of a glucose in the dark reaction. So does, do you guys understand the difference between cyclic and non-cyclic electron flow? Yes. Okay. I mean, it's really pretty simple. It's just basically trying to make up extra ATP so that it balances out the equation. And it's not wasting anything. Because if it didn't do this, then it would be wasting either ATPs or NADPHs. All right. So chemiosmosis, um, this is just a quick review. You guys know this. Uh, we have ATP synthase in mitochondria. We have ATP synthase in chloroplasts. They're the same. Uh, you can take ATP synthase from mitochondria, stick it in a chloroplast, it'll work. Take it out of chloroplast, stick it in a mitochondria, it'll work. So I might ask you on a test, where'd you find ATP synthase in a human? And the answer would be mitochondria because humans don't have chloroplasts. But then I might ask you, well, where would you find ATP synthase in a plant? And you would say mitochondria and chloroplast because remember plants need mitochondria to make it through the night. So plants have mitochondria and chloroplast and both of those contain ATP synthase. And remember ATP synthase works by that pH gradient, right? That buildup of protons across the membrane. The only difference is, and I don't care that you know this, I'm not gonna ask you this on the test, but photosynthesis generates a massive amount of charge. It, it generates 1000 times the charge, uh, I'm sorry, 100 times more charge. So two more pH points, remember each pH is 10, uh, 10 to the first uh, protons. So a pH difference of five to eight is a thousand times more. 10 to the third, or 10 times 10 times 10, uh, hydrogen ions. Um, in, in the mitochondria, the pH difference is only about one. Here, the pH difference is three. So there's about a hundred fold more concentration of protons in the chloroplast than their difference in the chloroplast than there is in the mitochondria. So that, that means that there's a lot more energy being generated during photosynthesis than there is uh, during cellular respiration. Okay. So this is the summary slide. Just remember photosystem two is first. You know, question, I might put this on the test and ask you, what's the reaction chlorophyll here? Is it A, B, or carotenoids? So the, what's the reaction center chlorophyll? Is it A or B or the carotenoids? All right, so I'll just save some time. The reaction center chlorophylls are always A, right? And both photosystem one and photosystem two. The accessory chlorophylls are the Bs and the carotenoids, the ones that are on the outside that are part of the antenna complex. Um, yeah, I might ask you what's the final electron acceptor for this. You should tell me NADP plus that takes the electrons. You should know what's being made. Uh, so remember what goes in and what comes out uh, and so forth. So all, all these NADPHs and ATPs go to the Calvin cycle, which we're going to talk about now. And then 
to make sure you know ATP synthase is part of photosynthesis. All right, any questions about the light reaction? Like I said, um, if you're a visual learner, jump on YouTube and there's some videos there. Uh, you can go to Khan Academy. Um, like I said, you know, a lot of people that do these science videos on YouTube, you know, they have millions of subscribers and they make, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year off of these videos. So, you know, you should take advantage of that. They're like really good production videos. All right, I can't afford that. Um, okay, so the Calvin cycle, the dark reaction, uh, this is where we use the ATPs and the NADPHs that we made in the light reaction uh, to make, uh, to turn carbon dioxide from the air into sugar that plants can store. Um, and remember those, they store those sugars as, as amylose, which we learned about in chapter five. And you guys call this carbs. Right? That's just the mainstream term for it. Long chains of glucose. The dark reaction or Calvin cycle is a lot like the Krebs cycle. What you start with is what you finish with. Um, in the Krebs cycle, we started with oxaloacetate. You might, I didn't tell you you had to know that, so you might not remember that, but it's true. You can go back and look. In the Calvin cycle, we start with something called ribulose biphosphate. And I talked about this before. Remember what ends in OSE? You guys remember? Like glucose and fructose and lactose. Sugars. Yeah. So it's a sugar. It's a sugar. It's a ribose sugar. So it's just like your DNA, your deoxyribose, or or RNA, your ribose sugar. Uh, it's very similar, but it has two phosphates attached to it. We call it RUBP for short, ribulose biphosphate. So, you know, it's a simple five-carbon sugar. Um, carbon enters the cycle as carbon dioxide. So remember, acetyl-CoA came in to the Krebs. Carbon dioxide is going to come into the Calvin cycle from the air, from you know, around the plants, um, and then it, it's going to get uh, made into a three-carbon sugar called glyceraldehyde three phosphate. This is the if you look, you'll see that this is in the middle of the glycolysis. When we split glucose, it's the same sugar. And that's chapter nine. All right. Okay, so this is where we just talked about we need three carbon dioxides, uh, nine ATP. Nine ATP and six NADPHs. So on the test, I might ask you, well, where do we get the extra ATP from if it's made in a one-to-one -one ratio? And you would tell me it's from? Cyclic electron flow, right? That makes the additional ATPs. All right, so Calvin cycle is in three phases, uh, carbon fixation, carbon fixation, reduction, and then we have to regenerate the RUVP. Uh, because remember, it wouldn't be a cycle if it didn't start, if we didn't end with what we started with. So here it is. Uh, we're going to do it in each phase. First one is fixing carbon. So three carbon dioxides come out of the air. And this is ribulose biphosphate. It, we're just going to go with the hardest version of it. It has uh, each of these uh, silver circles as a carbon. So it has five carbons in it, just like we predicted, because it's a it's a ribose sugar, five carbon sugar. Um, it's a pentose. It's a biphosphate, so it has phosphates on each end. Remember the phosphates on the end are negatively charged. So it's gonna they're gonna repel each other. So it's gonna act to weaken this molecule. When we add a sugar, when we add another carbon dioxide to it, it makes it evenly weakened. So it's not, the weak point isn't right in the middle of a molecule, it's in the bond. I don't know if you make that makes sense or not, but that's why this works. This is an enzyme. It's really weird because enzymes usually end in ASE, but for whatever reason, somebody decided to not name this appropriately, kind of like carbs. 
Uh, so Rubisco is the enzyme that takes carbon dioxide and adds it to ribulose biphosphate. And it also kind of splits this apart. So, so we have three of these, three five carbon sugars, right? We're just gonna, I'm just gonna follow, uh, sorry, three times five carbons is 15 carbons. We're just gonna follow the number of carbons so you can see what's going on here. So we have three carbons that come out of carbon dioxide. And in the end, after Rubisco is done with RUBP and carbon dioxide, we end up with this molecule. You don't need to know the name of it. I could care less that you know that. But this is these are six, three carbon, one, two, three carbon sugar. So there's 18 carbons here. So we had 15, right? We added three. And we now we have 18 carbons. So we have six of these three carbon sugars. That's the carbon fixation phase. So we've we've converted RUBP into six three carbon sugars. And the enzyme that's done that is Rubisco. You need to know that. You need to know the name of this. This is the most important enzyme on the planet. Uh, without it, we would all be dead. Um, all right. So we made six three carbon sugars. We use six ATP to add phosphates to it to weaken the bonds again. Uh, NADPH is also added here to help rearrange these molecules. So this gets rearranged into uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphate. This is from glycolysis. I showed you that in the pathway in chapter chapter nine. This is a half of a glucose. Now. We, we have six three carbon sugars, so we still have 18 carbons. We're going to spit out one of these uh, because we need 15 carbons to regenerate this. So we can only get rid of three carbons or only one of these. We need the other 15 to go back to make more ribulose biphosphate because what we start with is what we have to end with. So that's the reduction phase. What does reduction mean? You gain an electron. Right, excellent. Gain electron. So what's gaining the electron here? This G3P molecule is, right? Um, so that's why it's called the reduction phase. Where's the electron come from? It's transferred. Is it transferred or is it um, a, what's it, the right? Yeah, it's it's transferred from what molecule? What's our electron carrier? The NADPH. Exactly. So so G3P is is uh, reduced. Um, NADPH is oxidized. The electrons come from NADPH to here to power this cycle. Um, and then the last phase is we have to regenerate our UBP. There's a whole bunch of arrows here. And the reason is, is because uh, there's a lot of research that's being funded into this. Um, most, most of it is from the Department of Energy. Um, but we really don't know how, how exactly this process works of converting this into this. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a magic arrow. This is pretty well understood, but this isn't. Um, and, you know, scientists want to learn this uh, and want to know how this works, because this, this could be the secret to uh, producing, you know, uh, carbs uh, by other means besides photosynthesis, like maybe deep in the ocean or on other planets. That don't get the same kind of light or the same wavelength of light, um, or uh, they're using this uh, these lipids as alternative fuel sources for like jet fuel uh, and things like that, uh, or even you know even I mean this the light reaction is very similar to how our solar panels work. So how do we make those more efficient? How do we make more electricity? so we don't need as many panels 
to powerhouse or you know like elon musk you know built one to power a whole city in uh australia i think so you know how do we how do we make less panels to get more electricity and not, and the secret may just be by looking at nature and figuring it out so those are the three phases do you guys have any questions about that All right, like I said, you don't need to know the names of all this stuff, right? You don't need to know, and you don't really know, need to know any of this. You need, do need to know what carbon fixation is, which means Rubisco takes carbon dioxide and converts it with RUBP to make glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And that's in the reduction phase. You need to know what reduction is. You need to know that we need ATP and NADPH is in here. So what goes in, we need, nine ATP, three CO2. This is what you really need to know. And uh, six NAD, NADPH. And what comes out is one glyceraldehyde three phosphate, which is essentially half of glucose. Um, and, then, and then we regenerate our UBP. So that, this is really what you need to know. Make sure you know what Rubisco is, that it's the enzyme that, that uh, catalyzes this carbon fixation. Um, make sure that you know that we need ATP and NADPH to do the reduction phase. Um, the three ATP, the additional three ATP we use to regenerate this, but nobody knows really how. And then know what comes out of here, right? Know that uh, half of a glucose comes out and we recycle the RGBP. That's really all you need to know for that. Um, all right, so some application questions. Uh, remember it costs three ATP and two NADPH per carbon dioxide. So nine ATP, six NADPH. We already talked about that. You saw this here. Six plus three is nine. And then we have six here. So same thing in a word form. Nine ATP, six NADPH. And that makes a half of a glucose. So, you know, I might ask you on the test, what? So, how many, how many ATP, and how many NAD pHs do we need to screw in a light bulb? No, I'm just kidding. To make uh, one glucose. Okay, go. So the nine and the six is for half a glucose, right? Exactly. So 18 and 12. That's right. Exactly right. And I might ask you, well, what about, what if we want to make one maltose? What will we need? Make it a little trickier. See if you're paying attention in chapter five. Two glucose. Right. So then we would need twice as much. So we would need 36 and 24. Good. Where am I? Okay. All right. So this animation used to work, but now that they've stopped supporting uh, Adobe, has stopped supporting um, its animation stuff. That doesn't work anymore. Uh, but you can find probably an animation. Let me see if I can find something on YouTube to show you guys. The dark reaction or the color. This kind of In goes over the whole page. So. They need inputs uh, of carbon dioxide, water. Okay, so this kind of is the whole thing. And energy. The chemical process by which plants use these resources to manufacture glucose, the building blocks of plants, is called photosynthesis. In the process, oxygen gas is produced as a byproduct. 
the energy for photosynthesis originates in the sun and arrives at the earth as sunlight. This light has both a wave and a particle nature. The particles or photons are the smallest units of light. Photons oscillate along a path, which is measured as wavelengths. The light emitted from the sun contains photons in a wide spectrum of wavelengths called the electromagnetic spectrum. Photosynthetic organisms use only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum called visible light. Photosynthetic organisms contain pigments that facilitate the capture of wavelengths of light in the visible light range. The color of the pigment comes from the wavelengths of light reflected. Plants appear green because they reflect yellow and green wavelengths of light. Red and blue wavelengths of light are absorbed by these pigments and provide the energy that is used for photosynthesis. Within eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms, also known as photoautotrophs, the chemical reactions of photosynthesis occur within plant cells in specialized structures known as chloroplasts. Photosynthesis consists of two sets of reactions, the light-dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle. Within the chloroplast are small disc-like structures called thylakoids, which are surrounded by a fluid-filled space called the stroma. The reactions that synthesize glucose, the Calvin cycle, occur in the stroma. The light-dependent reactions occur in the thylakoid. It is... So that's important. You guys need to know where these reactions occur. So if I ask you on the test where the Calvin cycle is, you tell me the stroma. If I ask you where the light reaction is, it's in the thylakoid membrane. The thylakoid. It is here that conversion of light energy to chemical energy is initiated. In most photosynthetic organisms, thylakoids contain pairs of photosystems called photosystem one and photosystem two that work in tandem to produce the energy that will later be used in the stroma to manufacture sugars. The photosystems of the thylakoid consist of a network of accessory pigment molecules and chlorophyll, the molecules that absorb the photons of light. Within the pigment molecules, the absorbed light energy excites electrons to a higher state. Photosystems will channel the excitation energy gathered by the pigment molecules to a reaction center chlorophyll molecule, which will then pass the electron. So remember, the reaction center chlorophyll is always chlorophyll A, and in photosystem 2, it works best at 680 nanometers, and photosystem 1, it works better at 700 nanometers. Yeah. ...to a series of proteins located on the thylakoid membrane. Photons of light strike photosystems 1 and 2 simultaneously. We will examine what happens with the photons striking photosystem two first. The energized electrons are passed from the reaction center of photosystem two to an electron transport chain. The electrons lost by photosystem two are replaced by a process called photolysis, which involves the oxidation of a water molecule producing free electrons and oxygen gas. While this oxygen gas is a by so why did they say that it's an oxidation of a water molecule? What does oxidation mean? Gains an electron. So, so remember Leo, the line goes grr. So if you lose an electron, you're oxidized. So remember, water's giving up the electron. So water's losing electrons. That's why water is oxidized. And what gets the electrons, what's gaining the electrons is that chlorophyll A, P680. Bonds and oxygen gas. While this oxygen, which involved Fort chain, the electrons lost by photosystem two 
are replaced by a process called photolysis, which involves the oxidation of a water molecule producing free electrons and oxygen gas. While this oxygen gas is a byproduct of photosynthesis, it is an important input to the cellular respiration pathways. As electrons pass through the electron transport chain, the energy from the electron is used to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma to the thylakoid, creating a concentration gradient. This gradient powers a protein called ATP synthase, which phosphorylates ADP to form ATP. The low energy electrons leaving photosystem two are shuttled to photosystem one. Within photosystem one, low energy electrons are re-energized and are passed through an electron transport chain where they are used to reduce the electron carrier NADP plus to NADPH. When the chloroplast is receiving a steady supply of photons, NADPH and ATP molecules are rapidly being provided to the metabolic pathways in the stroma. Therefore, the ATP and NADPH formed during the light-dependent reactions are used in the stroma to fuel the Calvin cycle reactions. The Calvin cycle consists of a series of reactions that reduce carbon dioxide to produce the carbohydrate glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The cycle consists of three steps, the first of which is carbon fixation. In this step, carbon dioxide is attached to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, resulting in a six-carbon molecule that splits into two three-carbon molecules. The second step is a sequence of reactions using electrons from NADPH and some of the ATP to reduce carbon dioxide. In the final step, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate is regenerated. For every three turns of the cycle, five molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are used to reform three molecules of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. The remaining glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is then used to make glucose, fatty acids, or glycerol. It takes two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to make one molecule of glucose phosphate. Thus, the Calvin cycle has to run six times to produce one molecule of glucose. These molecules can remove their phosphate and add fructose to form sucrose, the molecule plants use to transport carbohydrates throughout their system. Glucose phosphate is also the starting molecule for the synthesis of starch and cellulose. Plants produce sugars to use as storage molecules and structural components for their own benefit. By utilizing the energy of the sun, along with inputs of water and carbon dioxide, plants act as glucose factories. Photosynthetic organisms are the primary producers of glucose on the planet. They also produce oxygen gas as a byproduct and thus serve as the foundation of life, providing food and oxygen for the complex food webs on both land and in the oceans. Okay, so that basically summarizes uh, photosynthesis. So this is what the video went over, but energy enters the chloroplast is sunlight. We know that the photons from light, uh, and then that through the through photosynthesis is stored as chemical energy in the form of sugars and you know we can we can make different sugars so in the video talked about uh adding fructose to make sucrose or uh adding uh, glucoses together to make either carbs or um uh, like cellulose because we talked about that's also glucose it's just a a different form um and that 
those sugars uh, that are made in the chloroplast provide energy and skeletons, right, to make other organic molecules because plants, that's all they can make. They can't make, pro they don't get proteins from the air and they don't get protein from the soil. So they have to make it. And the same thing with bats. So they have to use all the sugars that they make to make uh, glycerol and the fatty acid tails so they can make their uh, phospholipid bilayers or lipids uh, or triglycerides or any of those molecules that we talked about. <clears throat> and you know that we plants make oils like you have olive oil and stuff like that. All of that comes from glucose. Um, even their DNA has to be made uh, from glucose. So that's what we mean by carbon skeleton. It, it's used to make all of those other macromolecules we talked about in chapter five. Um, it provides the raw material for ATP, right? That's a, ATP is really uh, an RNA molecule. And uh, you know that plants do respiration and they have mitochondria because right? they wouldn't survive through the night without that. So uh, ultimately on a, on a global scale, photosynthesis is the, is the most important process to life on earth. I mean, this is what caused the dinosaurs to go extinct. Um, you know, it, a major climate event, like a meteorite impacting the earth or volcanic eruptions or something like that um, would decimate life on earth. We would have a massive extinction event. Um, and, and just to give you an idea, uh, photosynthesis makes 160 billion metric tons of carbohydrates every year, which is, you know, a lot. And it's also important to produce oxygen, right, that we need to survive and reduce greenhouse gases to help maintain uh, the proper climate of the atmosphere. It's really so important that NASA has uh, satellites that simply monitor the level of photosynthesis of the planet from space. So uh, we don't really talk a lot about photosynthesis. It's really not a plant biology class, but it is it is really important for, for life, um, at least as, as we know it, except for uh, those uh, chemoautotrophs at the bottom of the ocean. They don't need sunlight. All right. So uh, unless you guys have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this lecture. And we're going to say that we're done with chapter 10. And I'm going to jump over to office hours. And uh, don't forget, I moved the test. So it's due Wednesday. All the quizzes and all that other stuff, the extra credit is also due Wednesday by midnight. Um, and I'll work on grading photosynthesis labs this week. You guys have any questions? Nope. Well, thank you. All right. All right. Uh, so um, good luck on your test if you haven't already taken it. And uh, I'll see you guys at lecture on Thursday, same, same time and place. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Bye.